All right, our text for today is going to be Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 22. And this is a passage where you see Jesus interacting with lots of people. And you think about ministry as a ministry is a, a delivering of God's grace and God's love and mercy and goodness to people. And Jesus is so effective at it. He loves people. Now, my question for you is, would you like to be effective like Jesus in reaching out and serving people? I, would, I will just accept a nod. Okay, well, I have a question for you. What? Are you crazy? People are hard to get along with. People are difficult. They're awkward. They've got their issues. Relationships can be so messy. You sure you want to get into this? This is ministry. Jesus shows us in this passage all the kinds of people that can create problems. You know, I'm a pastor now for, what, 27-ish years and I still have yet to have my uh, private jet so I can jet around and, and, and do my ministry all over the world. You know, I, I have yet to have, we do have a YouTube now, but I have yet to have a, a massive TV ministry with a bunch of senior citizens on fixed incomes sending in their, their seed offerings so that their lives can be blessed. Um, we get the wrong idea about ministry. Ministry isn't a way to take a limelight in front of the world and draw attention to yourself. Ministry is really about being a blessing to people. You got to be a people person. And that's hard. So I have another question for you. Are you tough enough to love? Love is the basis of the Christian walk. Jesus went to that cross out of God's love. God sent his son into harm's way because he so loved the world. And he hung there on that cross. Jesus hung on a cross with his arms stretched out for numbskulls and irritating people like me and like you. That's why Jesus went to that cross. Now I ask you, are you tough enough to love? And let's go back a verse because we're, we're marching faithfully through uh, we're marching faithfully through uh, the, the gospel of Mark. And last time we, we saw that this man with a withered hand, he, Jesus invited him forward and he healed him on a Sabbath. And of course that made some enemies. And the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians, if you remember that sermon. Uh, the Herodians and the Pharisees are on opposite ends of a political spectrum. And yet, politics makes strange bedfellows when you've got Jesus to hate. And so, all the haters from both ends, very comfortable to gather together and try and destroy Jesus. So, are you tough enough to love malicious enemies? Malicious enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In Romans 12, overcome evil with good. Don't hold a grudge. Let God handle things for you. So that's where we left off last time. Let's go on. Let's look at verses 7 through 10. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples. Now this is the Mediterranean, not the Galilee. Uh, the Mediterranean. So it's as far as west as you can go in Israel. And any further, you're going to be in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, he withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a large multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea. These are areas where we've already seen Jesus go, and we've seen him uh, minister to people. And of course, the word's getting out. Where else does the word go? When people who are feeling kind of needy and desperate, and there's a word of a miracle worker in Israel, the word gets around. And then from Jerusalem and from Idumea, that's region south of Judea, and beyond the Jordan, way over there on the, the east side of the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, that's up north along the coast. And these are Gentile areas, these are areas where there's a lot of commercial activity, uh, cultural differences, 
and, and people are getting the word that there's this miracle worker in Israel. A great number of people heard about everything that he was doing and came to him. We live in a very populated world and a populated culture, and sometimes we have a rock concert where people want to get in so bad that they'll press against the doors, and as soon as those doors open, they'll trample their way in, and once in a while you hear about people trampled to death. A, a Black Friday uh, shopping spree, and the door opens, and then people madly rush in. You get a little feel of that in this passage where there's people from all over, people that are unknown, foreign. They've got their differences. We don't really know if we feel safe around them. You know, you can think about the riots and things that happen when crowds gather and they're angry at something, and it's just not a safe place to be. And so, uh, and he told his disciples to see that a boat would be ready for him because of the masses so that they would not crowd him, for he had healed many with the result that those who had diseases pushed in around him in order to touch him. Jesus loved all these people, but these people could have created a dangerous situation for the disciples and himself. So are you tough enough to love desperate and unfamiliar people? Sometimes people get so desperate that they almost do anything to get over their desperation and it could be a very dangerous situation. And plus, if they're unfamiliar, you don't know if you can trust them or not. Yet, we have a world full of people that need Jesus. And are you tough enough to love them, no matter what? Let's go on to verses 11 and 12. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God! Which is true, by the way. But if you think about it, these are demon-possessed people who are speaking out the truth. And how does Jesus feel about that? Oh, well, hey, they're pointing me as the Son of God. That's a good thing. Keep it up. No, of course not. And he strongly warned them not to reveal who he was. From the Garden of Eden, we learn that anytime people have a conversation with the devil, it doesn't go well. And so Jesus doesn't want the demon-influenced people to be, for their own reasons, drawing attention even to him. You just don't know. The devil is a tricky, sneaky deceiver, and he's way smarter than we are. So it's very possible that that he could distract us and get us off of our mission to make Jesus famous by getting down into the weeds of people's motivations and, and what's going on. And So are you tough enough to love people who are possessed and troubled? Sometimes people can be so troubled they've lost their mind. And you don't know quite how to take that. And, and you feel sorry for some people that, that struggle with, with their own view of the world and maybe they're looking down on themselves and, and who knows what their motivations are, but they can do something very erratic and very dangerous all of a sudden. And of course, I do believe demons exist. Maybe the modern world denies that, but you see a lot of it in Scripture. Demons exist and they are very clever and they can influence people in ways that are quite dangerous. So are you tough enough to love the possessed and troubled people around you? Let's go on to Mark 3, 13 through 19. And he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. So of this large crowd, he gather, goes up a mountain, and he has a select few with him, maybe up to 120, some people think, but then among them, there's a few he's going to select even further. And he appointed 12 so that they would be with him, 
and that he would send them out to preach. So Jesus is looking for uh, a team of people who can extend his ministry to more people, right? Jesus is God. He's everywhere present in a sense, but yet he gave up the ability to independently use his divine attributes when he became a man. He can only be in one place at one time, and to maximize his fruitfulness, he wants to send some people with authority out two by two to go to towns and he would give them authority to have uh, to cast out demons even and to preach. And he appointed the twelve. Simon, this is also Peter, to whom he gave the nickname Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James. Uh, to them he gave the nickname Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. So already Jesus is seeing some personality traits of the people that he's having on his ministry team. And Peter, he knows, uh, Peter's personality is, is quite uh, brash, or he's, he's eager, he's, he's enthusiastic, he plunges into something, he knows that. He also knows that Peter one day will deny him three times. And then the Sons of Thunder, you wonder about that nickname. There's our brothers. Why would he call them Sons of Thunder? Don't quite know, but thunder is kind of a, a loud, booming, scary sound. And perhaps these are a little bit hot-tempered men. Whatever, whatever reason that is that Jesus called them Sons of Thunder, there's something about thunder that somehow characterizes these brothers. And Andrew, which is Philip's brother, and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas. Thomas, we know, later becomes someone who is not just a doubter, but a dogmatic denier. It can't be that he, you know, I'm not going to believe that's Jesus unless I put my finger in his nail holes and hit my hand in his side, right? So there's Thomas. There's James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and, of course, Judas. Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So these are people that Jesus is, is, considers his team to accomplish his work. And they're people that he actually depends on. He doesn't need to depend on people, but he does depend on people. He wants people to be involved in the, in the process of evangelism and announcing to the world that there's a Savior. And all of these people have their flaws. Are you tough enough to love flawed disciples and colleagues? I'm sure over the years I've disappointed you. You know, various uh, things happen in ministry and, and sometimes we can butt heads and obviously we're all flawed. And, and it, it's amazing grace that God would allow us to serve him and that God would give us enough authority to actually conduct the ministry for him. And it takes an immense amount of love to put up with awkward people, people that can be very annoying at times, special needs people, people with arrogant attitudes, people with stubborn disagreements, and they, they won't give ground or listen. Flawed, flawed, flawed people. Raise your hand if you're a flawed person. Okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so do you, do you love, are, it, are you tough enough to love even though there's flaws around you and there's flaws in you? Hopefully you're tough enough and the other person's tough enough to love you back. Okay. Let's move on to Mark 3, 20 and 21. This is, a, a, this is kind of a crazy one. This, this one made me scratch my head a bit. And he came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. Talk about hectic ministry of people needing Jesus' ministry to them. All of their desperation, and they're crowding in, and Jesus is even giving them the attention they need to the point that he's putting himself out, and he can't even eat a meal right? 
So what happens? And when his own people heard about this, his own people, I suppose that would be people not among the 12, not among the disciples per se, but his family, maybe some close family friends. And his own people heard about this. They came out to take custody of him for they were saying, what, are you crazy? They were saying, he's lost his senses. Jesus loved people to the point of seeming crazy. He had a ministry of tender, loving care to give to needy people, and the urgency of the moment, the crowd that was there, it just kept him focused on the people. At some point, you're going to get all frustrated, and, and you're going to want to get away and have a break. And of course, Jesus and his disciples needed a break from time to time. But it looked to the people that knew Jesus like he had lost his marbles because of this ministry. What were they thinking? Were they thinking, come on, he should know better than this? Doesn't he know these people are going to keep pressing until he starves to death if he doesn't take a meal? You know, does, does he think somehow he's getting some kind of satisfaction out of the need that people have and they come to him? You know, imagination can run wild of why this would be occurring. And people, I, I think his own people were loved ones that cared about him, but they didn't quite fully understand what was going on. Uh, so are you tough enough to love misunderstanding friends and family? You know, sometimes you'll get a criticism from somebody that you really don't care much about what their opinion is. Big deal. They call you a, a jerk or something, and you're thinking, well, consider the source. But when your close friends and family will say something, they should know better about Jesus, but they're still misunderstanding, and then that's got to hurt a little more than if it's just some strange person. Sometimes it's hard to receive criticism from friends and family who know you so well and should know better. But then sometimes you also have to say, Jesus doesn't have to say, but I do and you do, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe I shouldn't be this involved in this ministry. Step back, take a breath, you know, or whatever. Of course, Jesus does everything right, and he sets the example. And we want to be like him, but we can't be totally like him but we still want to love and not fly off the handle and, and get pouty because we're misunderstood even by friends and family. You know how God's speaking to you, and you sometimes just have to do it. And if you can't explain exactly why you have to do it, and your friends and family start to think you've lost your marbles, sometimes you just have to accept that and do what God says. That's how Jesus did it. And then finally, Mark 3, verse 22. And this is a launch verse into our next sermon, but I want to talk about some things first. Uh, the scribes, now scribes are Bible teachers, are the ones that are studied in the law. They're the ones who say, for instance, the Magi came to Jerusalem looking for the baby that was born king of the Jews, and Herod called the scribes because, well, they're the ones that can look in the Bible and see maybe some piece of wisdom to help you. These are the ones that were pretty confident of their understanding of God's Word. They are interpreters of the Bible par excellent in their own minds. And, of course, Jesus is way more popular than any of them. Some of them might love the crowds, as long as they were safe and they didn't have to miss a meal and they didn't, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff that Jesus had to put up with. Uh, but the scribes who came down from Jerusalem, the religious capital, you know, this is where all the, the scholars of the Old Testament are there. He's possessed by Beelzebul. That's an easy way to define my enemy and call him a name. He's demon-possessed, so I really don't have to listen to what he has to say because he's one of those people that, that have uh, succumbed to the lure of the devil. And he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. 
Are you tough enough to love jealous rivals? Sometimes people will be jealous because you're getting some fruit they're not. They think very highly of themselves and they don't know why you are doing better than them and they feel jealous, so they'll do something to discredit you. They'll do something to to draw some negative attention so that they feel a little bit better about themselves. Sometimes it's hard to love those people. I mean, it does happen. And you got to love them. They're people. People are image of God. Just by virtue of being image of God, people are are deserving of a, a degree of respect and rights being afforded to them and protected. Just because the person's on the opposite side of the political aisle, you don't want to discredit them, call them a name. They're haters over there, so we don't have to listen to them. That's a lazy man's way out. It really is the lazy man's way out. And we're always better when we can actually have our own views examined by people who disagree and carefully consider and weigh things out rather than just assume we're right and stubbornly plant our flag and say, you're never going to move me. Because I guarantee you, none of us have it all down pat. We're all in areas of needing to develop in our understandings. So jealous rivals do exist. Jealous rivals are probably one of my nemeses where I, I feel the most irked by, by colleagues and, and people that would define my motives different than what they are or not care to listen to what I have to say to explain my point of view that's just me. I mean, maybe somewhere on this list, you find someone very irritating, so that's how God's speaking to you. God's speaking to me on the jealous rivals issue, all right? Now, we want to show crazy amounts of love. You need to love people like crazy, and it's hard. <laughs> None of us are worthy of being loved other than the fact that we are image of God, and being image of God uh, it, it boils down to the ethic of the Christian life is that you love people. Loving them is to value them and to respect them as at least your peers and your equals, even if you disagree with them. People matter. People live forever in one place or another. We've got a lot of lost people in the world that are going to have a very a uh, miserable existence in the next life if they don't come to know Jesus. And some of these people are, are people that have, have wronged us so many times, our patience has run out and we just feel like giving up on them. We avoid them, we, we feel angry about them, we bear that for a long time. People, though, are meant to be loved. When we went through Galatians, God opened my mind to some thoughts about the law that that were really refreshing and helpful to my spirit. But Paul's talking about how we're not under a law anymore. You know, the, the faith has come. Jesus died on the cross. Now we're free from having to have that pedagogue over us. And he's thinking about his audience, and he asks a question on their behalf. Well, why the law then? Why do we need a law? Why the law then? And then he said the law was added because of transgressions. Well, what transgressions exist when there is no law? Well, you go back earlier in Revelation, or the the revelation of God over time began with let us make man in our image. And that implies that we need to love and respect and value and treat people well the way we would want to be treated. That's implicit in the fact that we're image of God. And so when people steal from each other, when they, they get angry and have a brawl, when, when they lie to get each other in trouble, these kinds of things are just so contrary to how you treat image of God that, and, and that's what the Jews were doing and God knew that the Jewish nation was, was called to produce a Messiah and to produce a Bible for the rest of the world. 
And that was going to be a 1,500-year process. So the nation needed to survive, but all those behaviors were self-destructive. So God brought a law. And God said, don't kill, etc. down the list. And so the law is, is descriptive of what love looks like. Love is the value of the Christian life that you want to maintain above all else. Now, we've defined how to love people as you get yourself out of the way your ambitions, you surrender them to Jesus and you let him use you to be a blessing to others. You're the channel of God's love to others. Being a blessing is way more important than having your way or being right in an argument. The person that you're talking to is a human being who you could plant seeds of God's love in and their life be changed. You can't change their life. They need to want their life to be changed, but you can plant the seed, and you can never give up on people. How many times should I forgive my brother? Well, Jesus says, 70 times 7, and that doesn't mean 490. That means forever. You want people to take responsibility. If they come to you and they say, oh, I repent, forgive them. As many times as it takes because they're image of God. And guess what? You're stubborn too. You rub people the wrong way too. And so you get yourself out of the way and you pour yourself into, into your ministry of being a blessing to other people, caring about people. We're all different. Our personalities are different. Some people are more bubbly. Some people are more sedate. Some people are, are outgoing. Some people are reserved. And that's all okay. Everybody's got a personality given to them, gifts given to them, and the opportunity is there to be a blessing to others. You can reach people I can never reach because you're different than me. I can reach some people maybe you couldn't reach because I'm different from you, and it's all good. It's all good. And that's how God made us. So we want to show crazy amounts of love. We want people to think of Scott Lake Baptist Church as those weirdos that just keep giving and, and appreciating people and being kind and, and at great expense to themselves and their time. They go out of the way to help people. That's the kind of mission we want. And I, I'm so proud of this church. We've got a, quite a few people within our body who have special needs, right? And maybe they won't fit in at some places. We want them to feel at home here. So this is a, a passage uh, that speaks to loving like crazy. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another. <laughs> but that's not easy. No, it's not. At times, you kind of bear with me and it may not be easy. But we do bear with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, it's not limited to other people having to forgive me. It's also me having to forgive other people. Anyone who has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Wait a second. The Lord gave, forgave me of a cosmic crime against him. Whatever sin you have is basically a rebellion against God and his, his universe that he has created and rules. And so we should get out of our own way and be able to forgive. Looking inside and, and figuring out where we can let go of some misunderstandings and, and listen and try and help a relationship. Uh, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. That word unity is so important. Unity is not uniformity, right? What's the difference between unity and uniformity? Uh, Baptists, I'm afraid to say, we're pretty good at the cookie-cutter model, right? you got to be this way. Because that's the way we've learned it, and that's the way we're going to stick with it, and everybody's got to be 
cut out of the dough with the same shape cookie cutter. Nonsense. Unity has nothing to do with uniformity. Unity has to do with a common purpose. We are all about advancing Jesus in this world, surrendering more of ourselves to him to be more fruitful in his work. That's going to unite us. What Jesus are we talking about? The Jesus of the Bible. Jesus of the Bible is our Lord and Savior. Uh, Do we understand everything exactly the same about him? Perhaps not. And there may be some room for some debates on some other uh, peripheral issues. But Jesus is God. Jesus is virgin born. Jesus is sinless. He is the one and the only Savior. Jesus died on a cross as a substitute for us so that our sins could be punished without it being on our own person that that the wrath is poured out, right? Jesus rose again the third day. He did. Fact. Historical fact, I don't care. Anywhere in the world, a scholar can go do honest research and have to come to the conclusion Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended to heaven, and he is there at the right hand of God even now. Jesus is coming again. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going to rule this world. That's the Jesus the Bible gives us. If that's your Savior, you can have your preferences of music. You can have your opinion about what to wear in church. You can have uh, differences of opinion on some of the issues that come up in the Bible that don't bear on salvation. But they are within your parameter as a free human being who loves Jesus to make your best choice of how to understand something and how to apply something in your situation. I'm not in your situation. I can't say as a one-size-fits-all, always do it this way. We're not cookie-cutter copies of each other. We're in unity, but not uniformity. Let's move on. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. There's no higher calling than giving your life to Jesus to be his spokesperson. And I think everybody's a verbal minister to some degree, right? I stand in a pulpit, you may not, but you have people that you can reach out to and give an encouraging word to, and you can also lead by example. But we have the highest calling of all, and that is to get out of our own way and lift up Jesus. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance, woe, for one another. The world's a very intolerant place these days. If you're on this side of the political aisle or you're on that side of the political aisle, the other people are, are, are haters. That's not tolerance. There needs to be a way of, within the church, everybody loyal to Jesus. It's our saving faith anchored in him to tolerate differences. I, I, I'm a little embarrassed as a Christian minister when I consider the, the humongous variety of labels for churches, right? You got Lutheran and Pentecostal and you got Presbyterian and Baptist and you've got whatever else you've got. If they all have Jesus as their Lord and Savior, why can't they be Christian? And why do people have to outdo one another in showing off their loyalty to a tradition? Oh, yeah, well, our tradition is you wear this, or our tradition is you listen to that music, or our tradition is who cares? Is Jesus in the midst and running your church through his spirit and word? That's what matters. All humility, gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. There's the unity word again. Notice the next word in the bond of peace. Peace gets at us in, in, in multiple ways, but, but one way I think we need to be tolerant of each other is emotionally. 
See, I can stand here so proud that I can let you live even though you disagree with me. Look how tolerant I am. I can bear in my heart a lot of animosity because you differ from me. What good is that to put on an air of tolerance if you don't really have a deep down love and appreciation and compassion for the other person that you're supposed to tolerate? The bond of peace. Guess what? You stand or you fall based on your relationship with Jesus. I don't control your relationship with Jesus. You don't control mine. We can let each other off the hook because it's Jesus that matters. And think about all the people you wouldn't get to know and befriend and see their wonderful traits if you just draw a line and say, no, we can't fellowship with them because, and you name some issue that doesn't have to do with Jesus and salvation. Here's another one. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Boy, you want to pick a fight with me, how am I supposed to respond? Oh yeah, I'm tough too. Or, listen, maybe we can talk about this does not take into account a wrong suffered. You remember that thing you did to me 20 years ago that I'm still angry about? Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Believes all things. I love the NIV here. It says, always trusts. You're always, you may not trust somebody who's wronged you over and over, but you're always looking for reasons to trust them, to build the trust back. You, you can't write off a Christian brother or sister forever and just set it in stone. You've got to be looking for ways to trust. Now, maybe you can't. Maybe it's not safe for you to do so. And obviously, you've got to be smart about it. But have enough hope in people that they can change and they can become trustworthy. Endures all things, love never fails. Here's an interesting one. Uh, Now, concerning things, sacrifice to idols. That was a big controversy in the early church. Can you go to a meat market and just buy anything and eat it when you have disagreements about that? Maybe some pagan worshiper blessed that piece of meat in the name of his demon god And now, is the meat tainted so the Christian can't eat it? It became a real debate, and they actually had to write to the honchos there in Jerusalem to settle the issue. Uh, But basically, Paul's idea is this. What's a demon? Who cares? How is that supposed to be any control over me? I can eat whatever I feel free to eat. But all things are lawful for me. Not all things are necessarily edifying And if I flaunt my freedom in front of my brother's face, who's not free to eat that meat, that's going to strain our relationship. So I would rather deny myself in order not to complicate the relationship. And it applies to so many things. But now concerning things, sacrifice to idols. We know that we all have knowledge. My knowledge is, I don't care, I'll go down to Dearborn where where the, at the McDonald's they have halal food that's been blessed by a, a Muslim, and I'll eat it. It doesn't mean I'm caving in my religious values. But you know what? Maybe a Christian would have a problem with it, so I don't flaunt it. But we all have knowledge. One person's knowledge and another person's knowledge doesn't necessarily measure up. What happens? Well, Knowledge puffs up. Well, yeah, I know more than you. Look at me. I'm out there. I'm the example. I know more than you. Love makes us arrogant. I mean, I'm sorry. Scratch that from the record. Knowledge, what we think we know, makes us arrogant. But love, wanting to be that blessing instead of Mr. Smart Guy, wanting to be that blessing, love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. 
love builds up. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. We get overconfident in what we think we know. And there's plenty of reason to listen out there. Different Christians might think different on a certain issue or another issue, women in ministry, gifts of, the, of tongues or whatever. If you think you know and you're standing confidently in what you know, just be careful. you got other people that you don't want to disrupt a, a, a relationship because you know better than they do. It doesn't matter what we know. It matters how we care, how we want to live our life. And we're free within our relationship with Christ to believe it the way we do. We don't have to win an argument over that. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. But if anyone loves God, now that's the bottom line. If anyone loves God, he's known by him. And if you love God and God knows you personally, my particular or someone else's particular belief doesn't necessarily obligate you. You've got to understand what you believe in, why, and walk the best you can as a Christian. The, the wonderful thing about the Christian life is God reaches out to his enemies and makes friends with them. And we come to Christ and we join with him and we become his friends all by grace. God has given us that gift. It's not something we've earned. Therefore, we're set free by grace. We could just fold our arms and say, hey, I don't care. I'm going to live my life my own way. Or we could say, the operating principle of my life is I'm going to be the best, most loving friend I can back to God. And that's the way a Christian can live their life and be fruitful. It doesn't matter what the results are. God's in control of who gets saved and God's in control of opportunities for the gospel. You're just in God's hands being a blessing because you want to be the best friend you can be back to God. Lots of issues come up among Christians. Can a Christian smoke? Well, there's nothing in the Bible particularly about that. And certainly we can have very good reasons to say no because of health and because of expense and whatever else. But ultimately, it's on the person to make a choice for them to be the best Christian they can be. I've shared this example before, but when I was in another church, a woman was addicted to both alcohol and cigarettes, and she had little children, and it was the addiction to alcohol that was making her a very unfit mom. And she acknowledged to me she needed to quit her bad habits, and she would start with smoking. And I said, do not start with smoking. Start with your drinking habit. Pour it out. Never go back to it. If God ever heals you from the craving to smoke, well, great. Worry about that years from now. It doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. Those kinds of, those kinds of areas of personal liberty don't define whether you're a good Christian or not. What defines is your desire to be good friends back to God because you realize you've been set free by grace. Now, please don't take up smoking. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. A couple verses to leave you with. That love covering a multitude of sins, I think, means we can all take ourselves a little less seriously and realize out of love, you're not going to nitpick on someone else. Right? 1 Corinthians 13, 13. But now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the highest virtue. And it's so adaptable in your situation. You, you don't need to have it proven to you that this person is worthy of love. This person's in the image of God. You've been saved. You can be a channel of God's love to that person. The greatest of these is love. And then, to close, <clears throat> think about yourself. And think about Paul, who really considered himself the worst sinner of all because he persecuted the church. 
He said, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. We can rest in that. If you're on your deathbed and you got serious questions, what's my relationship with God? God loves you because he's a generous, loving God, and you can rest in that. Jesus is the one. You trust him to be your Savior. You give him your life, and you be the channel of blessing that he's called you to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word, which is challenging and convicting to us because your spirit is within. And I pray, Lord, you'll help each one of us to latch on to something from this list of people that Jesus ministered to and loved that would help us to step up and be more willing to be the blessing in those situations that are challenging to us. Thank you that Jesus loves even me and each one of us. In his wonderful name we pray. Amen.